So, continue steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So prayers. What else do we pray for? We pray for those who are suffering spiritually, those who, have, who are persecuted. We want to remember them in prayer. And if you yourself are suffering in this way for righteousness sake, now don't forget to pray. The Lord will be very near you to help you because you're suffering for His sake, for truth's sake. Uh, you can be very sure God will be very near you, close to you, and He will want very much to help you in your time of need. But He wants you to pray, all right, to ask of Him the grace and the help and the wisdom you need. And He will help you. He will guide you. He will grant you the strength. He will grant you the wisdom. And then you begin to experience God in a very real way. Right? His presence, His power with you. We want also to pray for those who are suffering. Suffering physically. The sick. In Acts chapter 28, we find such an instance. Uh, in Acts 28 and verse 8. Over here we have the Apostle Paul visiting someone who was sick. It came to pass, Acts 28 verse 8, and came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed. Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. So those who were sick, they were prayed for. Of course, in those days, well, the apostles were equipped and empowered with the sign gifts, right? The miraculous gifts, they could lay hands on the sick and they were miraculously healed. Now today all these sign gifts have been withdrawn, right? These sign gifts were given at that time for a very, very special purpose. To authenticate the apostolic office and ministry and the, and the word, right? That they would preach and teach and write as scripture. So it was for a very special time and special ministry. But now the, the apostolic work and ministry is done. Scripture already completed. Church established. When the apostles passed away, all these gifts are seized, right? passed away with them. But nonetheless, the, the ministry of prayer continues. And in the epistle of James, you turn to James. Chapter 5. And here it says, in verse 14, James 5 verse 14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him. The elders of the church, teaching, ruling elders, and let them pray over him, anointing him with all in the name of the Lord. Anointing him with all. Now it's interesting here that the word anointing is not the usual sacred anointing, right? Which is the Greek word krio. That's where we get the word Christos, right? Christ, the anointed one. The word used here, anointing, is another word for anointing. Alepho. And alepho has the idea of rubbing. You know, rubbing ointment. So it has the idea of medicine being applied. All, of, all in those days had medicinal qualities and value. So here it gives us the idea you pray, but don't forget about medical attention, right? Medicine is necessary, is good. We need medical doctors and we need medicine. Okay? At the same time, we don't forget to pray. So nowadays, when you are sick, yes, go and see the doctor, get the medicine, 
but also don't forget to pray, right? And of course, you can ask your, your pastor to pray for you, your elders to pray for you. And when you t take the medicine each time, you pray, right? You pray. Before you partake of food, you say grace, right? Before you take your medicine, pray also. The Lord will use the medicine to help you recover. So medicine is important. Today in the charismatic church, they say, well, you just have to pray, pray for miraculous healing. Don't take medicine. Well, that's very dangerous, right? If you take medicine, means you are faithless, no faith. Now, this is, this is heretical teaching, right? And can be very destructive and harmful to you. So here we are told, right, pray. And then apply medicine as well. Don't forget about that. God gave all these things for, for our help. Rubbing him with all in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sin, sins, they shall be forgiven him. Sometimes our sickness or the diseases we are afflicted with may be due to sins we have committed. And the Lord is chastising us. Not all the time, right? The case, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, when you get sick, I mean, not necessarily because you have sinned. Sometimes it's due to natural phenomena, all right? We are living in a world, we get infected by viruses and bacteria, but sometimes the Lord uses such things, right? Sickness, illness, afflict us with, with diseases to chastise us. And if that is the case, of course, you are, if you are sick, you better be pre very prayerful. Lord, have I sinned against thee? All right? Please show it to me. And of course, if you pray humbly and sincerely, the uh, Holy Spirit will, will convict. Yes, then you better quickly repent and seek forgiveness. And if you have done anything against the church and you are afflicted because of it, uh, you call your elders, right? Pastor to come. Confess your sins. And get your elders to pray for you and over you. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Right? Public sins you have committed. Then you confess your... Or you have sinned against someone. Or confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that ye may be healed. And sometimes the Lord chastises us with sickness and disease. And when we confess them, He forgives. And of course, if the sickness is due to sin, once you're forgiven, of course, the sickness will also go away. Right? The Lord will heal you. And you will get well. Just like in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, those who partook of the Lord's table unworthily uh, became weak. Right, fall sick, and some even die. So, back, so when you, you, you find yourself in such a situation, uh, better quickly repent, right? confess your sins, get right with God, and you'll be forgiven. And then you'll recover, and you'll be restored right, to right communion and fellowship with the Lord and with one another. The effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So make sure you, you're not continuing in sin, but continuing in righteousness. So when we do fall into sin, the Lord chastises us. The righteous thing to do is what? Get right with God, right? Confess, repent, uh, seek reconciliation and restoration. And of course, if you pray like this, God will hear and answer your prayers. It's God's will to forgive us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He promises us that. So if you confess your sins and seek forgiveness, will He forgive? Sure, He will. It's a very gracious, merciful God. Right? Do that. And sometimes also when we pray, the Lord may not choose to heal either. Sometimes the Lord sends sickness and disease or physical infirmities, afflict us with these things to sanctify us. Remember the Apostle Paul. Uh, he had a thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh. A, a, 
a physical malady, some very painful sickness or disease he was afflicted with. And he prayed to the Lord three times, right? Lord, remove this from me. Take this away. Then the Lord each time told him, my grace is sufficient for you. And then when he prayed that way, you know, sometimes we wonder why the Lord does not deliver us and allow us to suffer in this way. And you pray, the Lord will give you the wisdom and eventually he understood why. And he stopped praying. Now I understand why I'm afflicted. And Paul says, well, he acknowledged the Lord allowed him to go through all these things to humble him. And the thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. Right? Messenger of Satan. Well, the Lord allows Satan to afflict sometimes. He uses Satan also to, for our own good, right? to afflict us. We might remain humble and sanctified because Paul said, I'm very prone to pride. You know, all the visions and the revelation he has received, the success in ministry that he had accomplished can easily cause him to be proud. So the Lord sends this painful affliction so that daily, right, he is reminded, I am weak, I am nothing. And if I am able to do God's work and if I succeed in ministry, it is all because of the Lord, right? His power, His work in my life. It's not because of me. So that He might remain a sanctified vessel. Not proud, but humble, clean, right? And useful for the Lord. He becomes proud, and then He'll become useless. So He thanked God for that. So sometimes we must be sensitive. Why does the Lord send these things in our life? And if we need to understand why, the wisdom of God, as we read in James chapter 1, you pray and he will give you that wisdom liberally. Now, sometimes that verse in James chapter 1 is, is misapplied. You know, students taking exams and they, and they want to get good grades. So I pray, Lord, I pray for wisdom so I will recall and know how to write, give the right answers, get an A. Uh, no, that is in the context of what? Uh, trials and testings you go difficulties you go through in life and you need the strength the grace and the wisdom to understand the will and the purpose of God uh, God it's not right to give you the right answer in taking exams and things like this sometimes so misapplied okay so pray so important pray for the sick and the Lord will and when you pray Right? The Lord will give you spiritual grace to cope with your physical sickness and illness day by day because when you get sick, you can be so discouraged and depressed. And so you pray. And then the Lord will, will encourage you, right? Um, lift you up, grant you the joy and the peace that you need to cope with your weakness or your sickness and affliction day by day. Okay? And then what else uh, do we find over here? Now before I, I go on, you know, you, can, you, you should pray for yourself. And sometimes the Lord can also heal uh, in a wonderful way. And if it's the Lord's will, He can heal you miraculously. Right? Not through any intermediary agent. Your, your pastor come and lay hands upon you and then you're healed. No, but you can pray on your own. And we can pray for one another. And if it's God's will, right, He can heal miraculously in a direct way. Okay? Or heal in a way most unexpected. Well, there was one time I was in uh, Indonesia, in Medan. I was invited to speak in a church there. And then the, before the service, I was brought out to lunch. And then I had a good meal. But after the meal, well, I, I had food poisoning. It was quite a bad one. I was vomiting, I was purging, you know, like, and, and, and it was a difficult time. And, and that evening I was supposed to preach. 
I didn't know how, how I would be able to make it or to manage. And I told the pastor, I'm feeling very sick. And so what to do? I still have to fulfill my duty to preach that evening. So what do you do in such a situation? You have to pray very hard. I think it was due to the, you know, to the soft drink I, I, I drank. I asked for ice. Don't ask for ice in such, in certain places the ice is not clean, right? And so I prayed very hard. And you know the stomach is cramping and you really sometimes need to run to the, to the toilet, right? And uh, how? You can't do this in the middle of a message. So you pray, Lord, you sent me here. I'm supposed to deliver your word. I'm doing your will. Please help me. And so just before I went up to preach, you know, I was feeling very bad, right? Stomach cramping, pain. And I prayed, Lord, please deliver me. And then just before I went up to preach, the pain all left, right? No more pain. So I went up to the pulpit, I preached. I thought I, I, I preached only 15 minutes and then I have to go, right? Keep my message short and sweet. Can't give all the message. But I preached for about 45 minutes. And there was no problem. And no one would realize I was sick, right? And after I finished my, completed my sermon, I went down, pain came back. <laughs> well, at least I, you know, I was able to fulfill uh, the Lord's duty for me. So, God hears and answers prayer, right? If, is, if you're doing His work, fulfilling His will, you're in trouble, you pray, uh, He will come to your help, give you the grace to do, right, His work. This was not only the first time, there was another time, and that was back in Singapore. And there was one, it was a, a Saturday night after, you know, a family uh, Bible fellowship meeting. I was on my way home. Suddenly, you know, sharp pain uh, at the side, right? The back and side of my body. I thought it would go away, but it, it didn't. The pain grew stronger and greater, you know, uh, through the night. And it was uh, quite excruciating. I never felt this kind of pain before. And then early in the morning, about 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I couldn't take it anymore. I, I couldn't sleep that night because of the pain. And, and, and the pain was so intense that I felt I had to, you know, get to the hospital, right, to, to seek treatment. But the next day, Sunday morning, would be what? worship service. I needed to preach. And, and who is going to take my place? You know, at, at this time of the night, it's already early in the morning, and then in a few hours you'll be, you have to be in church to chair the worship and then to preach God's word. And if I went to the hospital that night, I, I knew, I mean, I'll be there for the long haul, you know, to observation, examination and things, I'll be warded. So I prayed that morning, about 3 a.m. in the morning, I prayed very, very intensely, Lord, you have to help me and deliver me from this so that I can do your work the next day. And then suddenly, pain went away, just like this. Pain left. And then I could sleep well for the remaining hours. Next day, went to church as if it was normal, no more pain. And I could, you know, uh, conduct the service, preach the word. And of course, on Monday, I went to the, the clinic to, uh, to get a checkup. And the doctor suspe suspe suspected that I had uh, kidney stones. So went for x-ray and it was all clear. Right. Later, of course, uh, took a urine sample, tested, results came out, yeah, traces of blood. So likely a kidney stone, but, but 
the Lord delivered. Maybe the kidney stone, after that prayer, the Lord took it all away. All right? And then after that, it was okay. So, uh, prayer. Sometimes the Lord allows this to take place. All right? So that you learn to pray. And you learn to depend on the Lord. And then you experience His deliverance. Then your, your faith increases. All right? uh, so, prayer is so good and so necessary, so important. So learn to pray. And when you pray all the more, you, when you pray all the more, you experience God to be very real and true and good, right? And yes, His power is there. His presence is there. And He wants you to experience His presence and His power. Then in the book of Acts also, we find that uh, the church prayed when they were choosing leaders in the church. For instance, in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6 and verse 6, and over here they were, they had to appoint deacons in the church, servants, uh, servant leaders in the church, Because there was a need in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually in prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, when they sat before the apostles and when they had prayed, uh, prayer involved, right? They laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased. So in the choice of leaders, uh, make sure you seek the Lord's wisdom, not only through His word, right? But also through prayer. And we find also in Acts chapter 14, Acts 14 and verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Uh, prayer must be a vital part in the choice of, of servant leaders in the church. And of course, the Bible has, has given us... Uh, certain things to look for in a leader, right? A pastor, an elder, or a deacon. And you read of that in the pastoral epistles in Titus, also in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, you have all the criteria in choosing right, someone to be a servant leader in the church. Elders and, and deacons. So make sure, right, you follow that biblical criteria. But don't forget to pray. And why do we sometimes need to pray? Because you may have a number of candidates that fit right, the biblical criteria of a servant leader that can be appointed to such positions of elders or deacons. But then you only need a certain number and not all of them. So which one to choose? And again, the, the Bible, again, you need to pray. Look at uh, Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we find that uh, you have the, the apostles of Jesus Christ. Now there were 11, because Judas already betrayed the Lord. He was disqualified. But the number had to be 12, right? It's a fixed number. There must be 12. And the scriptures also say someone will take the place of Judas. So the disciples knew this. They had to appoint another person. Right? There were 11, there must be 12. And so what did they do? Well, they prayed. 
because they had to follow the biblical criteria. But at the same time, they also prayed. In verse 20, For it's written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, as with reference to Judas, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric, his office, let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto, the, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us, with us the eleven, right, of his resurrection. So to be an apostle, uh, the criteria was you must be this, right? They, the, those who qualify must be those who have been with us, who have accompanied with us all the time from the Lord Jesus, that, from the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, until that same day that he was taken up from us. So he must have been with us in and out throughout the public ministry of the Lord. Right? The three and a half years. So that was the criterion. That's why today there can be no apostles of Jesus Christ. It's, it's only 12. There can be no more apostles. Some today appoint themselves apostles. In Singapore, we have two or three. Right? They call themselves apostles of Jesus Christ, of the same rank as Peter, James and John. That's very presumptuous of them. Because they're, one, there's only 12. And then if you want to qualify as an apostle of Jesus Christ, you must, you must fit this criterion. You must have been with the Lord Jesus when he was on earth for three and a half years, from the time of his baptism to his resurrection. You must have been with him throughout this time. Personal eyewitnesses of the teachings and the ministry, right? the baptism, the burial, the crucifixion, the resurrection of the Lord. How many of... How many of us today can qualify? No one. No one. There can be no apostles today. Right? So even at that time, when they were looking for such a person to take the place of Judas, to be the, the twelve, right? they only found two. And they appointed two. Joseph called Barsabas, and who was surnamed... Uh, uh, um, uh, Justice and Matthias. So there were two uh, 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 qualified candidates. But there can be only one. So which one? Which one to choose? So over here, of course, uh, we read of them praying, right? Verse 24. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. So they have to pray for wisdom. So, Lord, which one? The Lord gave them the wisdom. They cast lots. Right? In this case, they cast lots. And the lots fell upon Matthias, and he was chosen. But the Lord, when you pray to the Lord for wisdom, he may guide you and lead you to, make, to go about making the right decision in some other way, not necessarily casting lots. Right? So you have to be very sensitive how the Lord will lead. And... Um, and he will lead accordingly. Just like, you know, uh, just the other day, uh, Deacon Eugene was sharing with me how now you have an extension building project, you, you need an architect, and there were two suitable candidates, right, to be architect. Which one to choose? Well, and then later on, the Lord led you to, uh, to know which one was the Lord's choice, right? You committed this matter to prayer, and you made a certain decision, proposal, and then you know, things worked out accordingly and now you, you know who the Lord has appointed. The Lord knows the hearts of all men. Sometimes we can't see the, the things invisible, but the Lord sees uh, who is the, the right one, right? the suitable one, the best one for you. And, it, and then He leads you accordingly. Okay? So, don't just use your human reasoning. Yes, Sometimes, of course, we have to use common sense and things like this, follow also biblical criteria and pattern, but don't forget to pray. Right? Uh, and then the Lord will show you very specifically and precisely who is the one or what you must do. So prayer, very important.
Then what else do you pray for? Well, in the early church, in the New Testament church, they prayed for missions. And they prayed for missionaries. In Acts chapter 10, in Acts chapter 10 and verse, verse 9, And here we read. And on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, uh, sorry, yes. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And that's about, that's noontime. And when he went up to pray, of course, uh, the Lord showed to him how he must go and evangelize uh, to the Gentiles. Until this time, the gospel was going out to the Jews. But the, it was the Lord's will for them to go to the Gentiles. And the Lord, and when he prayed, uh, the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord was already pre preparing Cornelius also as he prayed uh, to prepare someone to be sent to him to preach to him the gospel. So, it, so pray for missions. When you pray, uh, the Lord will reveal to you uh, people in need or places that, re that are in need of, of evangelists or missionaries. And then, and then you take the step of faith and you go out right, to do His work, to fulfill the Great Commission. You pray for missionaries. Turn to Acts 13, verse 2 to 3. It says here, And, and there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that, were called, that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and uh, Manaean which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul as they ministered to the Lord and fasted the Holy Ghost said separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So as when they had fasted they were praying how to extend God's kingdom, how to serve the Lord more, well, the Lord revealed to them. You set aside Barnabas and Saul for missionary work. And when they had fasted and prayed, uh, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. So praying for missions and for missionaries. And the Lord also uh, uh, said, well, the harvest is plenteous, the laborers are few. Pray, all right? The Lord will send laborers out to the harvest. So we must pray for all these things. So do you pray? Pray for missions. Pray for more to be missionaries. More to be called to full-time service. You ought to pray. And so in the True Life BP Church, in our prayer meetings, uh, we make sure we pray for all these things. So in our prayer meeting, we pray for the church itself. We meet on Friday night because weekend is coming. We pray for the, the weekend activities of the church, fellowship meetings, and then on Sunday especially, the Lord's Day, a holy Sabbath. And every Lord's Day is an important day. And we, don't want, we do not want to minister and worship the Lord in vain. And if we want things to happen we better pray don't take things for granted so we pray each time for the lord's day pray for what we pray for the pulpit ministry we pray for the pastor who will be preaching as he prepares the messages how god must fill him with his word and with his spirit we pray for a faithful and careful exposition of the word and not just that The pastor can expound, can tell, but who is the one who does the teaching? And it's the Holy Spirit. So you have to pray to the Lord, Lord, please, as the word is faithfully preached and taught, may thy Holy Spirit work powerfully to convict and to convert, to sanctify and to edify. And the, the preacher, the pastor may be preaching from a text. 
And sometimes we wonder, can this text, which has this meaning, be applicable to so many people? Because all of us have different needs and experiences. How are the needs of the people to be met? You know, when you know, we are just preaching on this text and we are, have to stick to the text, to the meaning of the text. But you'll be surprised. All right? God's word is so powerful. And the Spirit's work also in counselling. The Spirit is called a counsellor, parakletos, a paraclete, someone who stands alongside you to, to guide you and to teach you. He'll guide you into all truth. He'll teach you all things, right? And the Spirit indwells us. The Spirit is not only a counsellor, He's a comforter. So in a congregation, of so many people with so many needs and people come with different kinds of problems and troubles they may be facing their own personal struggles and we as preachers or pastors cannot know everyone and we can't see also people's hearts sometimes they also don't reveal what they are going through but the Lord knows the Spirit knows. And our duty is to be very prayerful and purposeful when we prepare our messages. Pastors must be very prayerful. It's not just, you know, preparing messages is not just something mechanical. I just look up the commentaries or I look up my uh, concordance. I look up uh, uh, the Hebrew and the Greek grammars and and look at the original text to, to exegete. Yes, you must do your exegesis. But then at the same time, it must be very devotional and very spiritual preparation. You pray, Lord, this text, okay, now I know the meaning. I must expound it. I must cause the people to understand what the text means in its context. Immediate context, book context, theological context, you must preach the Bible very faithfully and accurately. But how to apply it? And then when you pray, right, this ministry of prayer, now the Spirit will also guide. And suddenly you have a burden. You have a burden. Just like the prophets, they speak of a burden the Lord has given to them. Right, a burden, something press, pressing in your heart. You need to discharge. The Lord gives a burden. Uh, you have a message. And then you apply accordingly. Right? The, know, the Lord knows the church situation. Pastor, you, as a pastor, as a human being, you may not know. But the Lord knows. And you, when you pray, right, the Spirit gives you a burden. And then you discharge that burden. And you find the church being built up, edified. Either rebuked, right? admonished, or encouraged, uh, depending on the situation. And then also, on top of that, the Spirit Himself is moving right? in individual hearts. Convicting and converting. Correcting right? and encouraging. Whatever the case may be. He's not only a a counsellor to counsel you, all right? you may be having questions, you may be going through struggles, or you, you need wisdom, and then through the message from the pulpit, even though it's from this text, and it means this, a spirit somehow mysteriously and wonderfully counsels you, all right? and then gives you the answer you're looking for, even through this message, gives you the wisdom, his own personal mysterious way, it meets your needs, right? it helps you. And then if you're going through struggles and difficulties, uh, the Holy Spirit also uses the word to comfort you. Right? He's the comforter. So I thank God that this is the case. We are not alone. You know, the pulpit ministry, yes. You must help yourself. You must work hard. You must prepare. But then there's also God's help. And Reverend Dr. Timothy Toe, our teacher, says, uh, self-help with God's help is the best help. What you can do, you do. What you can't do, God will do. Right? Ministering to individual hearts, those who come with sincere hearts to seek the Lord, 
uh, the Lord will minister in His own special way. The Holy Spirit within you will teach you and guide you through the pulpit ministry. Right? The message that is preached. So it's a, it's a very wonderful thing to see. And sometimes, you know, uh, after preaching, but you must make sure, right, you have humble, receptive hearts to, to respond to the Lord in the right way. You know, sometimes we respond the wrong way. And the word is preached and you are rebuked. And you say, why is pastor speaking about me? Actually, I never knew, right? That you have this problem. And I was not speaking about you. But there's something the Lord has put in my heart, a burden, or in the preaching. Not, the Spirit may be convicting. But you think I'm speaking about you. And then you tell it to me. Pastor, why you attack me from the pulpit or you're speaking about me? I said, no, I never knew you had this problem. Now that you tell me, now I know. <laughs> but I never knew it. But if the Lord is speaking, so I said, if the Lord is speaking to you, then you should be very thankful. Uh, he's ministering to you. Then if you know yourself, you are in the wrong. And he's correcting you, trying to sanctify you, chastising you. I didn't know about your problem. But now God is dealing with your problem. Right? Then better get right with him. So all these things. So the sermon must be bathed with prayer. Right? And then every Lord's Day you'll find, uh, the, you know, when the people come, it will be a meaningful service. And then the church will be continually sanctified as they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, right? In fellowship, in breaking of bread and prayers. They will go through this continuous sanctification. The church will grow, right? Become better and better, more and more powerful, effective as a witness and testimony for the Lord. And then the Lord will give the increase. Okay? you see that. So pray. Prayer meeting is so important. Corporate prayer. Come together, pray. Pray for your pastor. Pray for the session. Pray for the Lord's Day service. Uh, pray for the pulpit ministry. Pray that visitors, when they come, seeking the Lord, some of these are unbelievers. Uh, they will be convicted and converted. Right? So pray for all these things. They're very important. And then pray. In, in True Life Church, we also pray for the Bible College. True Life and FEBC have a symbiotic relationship. And we pray for the college. And the college will be opening again on Monday. I, I look forward to it. The opening again on, with a day of prayer. We also begin. We, we see the importance of prayer. So we want to begin the semester with prayer. There's been tradition from the beginning. Uh, day of prayer. It's not orientation. Right? It's prayer. We come and pray. Of course, there is uh, thanksgiving and singing. Word will be given, preached, and then testimonies heard. And then we share uh, uh, the needs, the college, and then we pray for one another and for the Lord's blessing for the semester. Day of prayer. So important. And I urge you also to pray for us. Please pray for FEBC. We need all the prayers we can get. And Satan, I mean, uh, wants to attack and destroy the college. Especially colleges that are faithful, will not follow the ways of the world. And these are far and few in between. Many of the colleges and seminaries have compromised the faith just to get more students and income. But we want to be faithful to the Lord. And it's not easy. We can be so easily tempted. We can so easily compromise when we're not careful. We know our frame. We know how weak we are. And we need to pray. And we need also the church to pray for us. Without the Bible college, the church would die. That's true. Paul Contento said. But without the church, the college would also die. We need the church to pray for the college. So please pray. 
for us. Pray for FEBC, faculty and students, and for and pray for faithful students who will become faithful servants. That's one of my prayers. All right, um, the Lord will raise up those who are truly and sincerely called. Brother Chilton was asking me, how do you accept, you know, receive uh, students into the college? Of course, we have certain criteria. But sometimes we can't tell what is in the heart, right? So we want to pray, sincere, genuine, truly called students will come in. And they are characterized by faithfulness. We are not looking for intelligent men and clever men. Not that intelligent or clever men are not welcome to study in the Bible college, but these are not the things we look for. And in secular universities, uh, if you are an honest student, right, uh, you are a genius or a bright student, they will welcome you, even give you a scholarship to study, right, because I mean, you will, you will put the school on the map. Uh, they, they, they are looking for such students. We don't look for such students. We look for the spiritual qualities, right? Faithfulness especially. And this, of course, is from the scriptures. You turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Second Timothy 2, verse 2. It says here, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Faithful men. Not clever men. Not cunning men. Faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And faithful men can become very intelligent men by the Spirit's empowering. The apostles of Jesus Christ, most of them were what? Unlearned men, right? They don't have a high education. Humble fishermen. Publicans, people despised by society. But then when they are faithful and they are indwelt and full of the Spirit, oh, they become so intelligent and so wise, right? So much so that uh, the Sanhedrin, when they, they, they put the apostles of Jesus on trial, they were amazed. How come we are hearing from such ignorant or unlearned men? Such wonderful things, you know? It's as if they have, you know, all gone through uh, university and attained the highest degree. How... So they were amazed. Uh, God's way is uh, the spiritual quality first, not the paper credentials. We look for faithful men. Not cunning men, but faithful men. Uh, they're so vital. And we need to pray for them. All right? We need to pray for them. Pray for such men. So please pray for us, pray with us. We pray also for missions, pray for evangelism. We pray that our evangelism will be effective. We have local evangelism, we have our evangelistic band. We go knocking on doors, we evangelize, personal evangelism also. Individual members will be evangelistic to reach out to their classmates, uh, to their colleagues at work. To your family, I pray for missions, we pray for missions and missionaries. And of course, as I've shared with you, about a quarter of our, our yearly expenses, we, we give to missions, to support missions and missionaries. And we have to pray that the funds given out, we must be good stewards of the funds, right? When we give the funds, we must make sure they are going to the right places and for the right purpose. And we also have to pray that our missionaries, those whom we support, will use the funds properly, right? And carefully and rightly. So this is what we all must pray for. We also pray for the sick and the elderly. And we pray for our children too. Sometimes, you know, children are neglected. 
In our prayer meeting, we pray for our young people and our children. I, I take this as a special concern and interest because I see young people. Now the world is so seductive and they are so easily tempted and drawn away right, by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They go to university, they sit under their professors, they are mesmerized by their intelligence and credentials. Sometimes they speak against the Bible, against the truth, and they be, can be so persuasive, and then they are easily drawn away. And they leave the church. You think, oh, Christianity is a very foolish and stupid religion. We are, now we know better, we are intelligent, we, you know, we use all these signs to, to tell us what is right, what is wrong, or true or false. And you think they, are, they have become clever. And then the Bible is, is very, very foolish and stupid. It's sad to see such things happening. Or so they go into national service and then... And then the culture in that place may not be so healthy. Instead of remaining sure and steadfast in the faith it's easy to compromise right to give in and then just follow the crowd just you know just not to be to be marked or ostracized or sort of you're not in the group but sometimes you have to take the stand certain things as Christians we do not do so it's easy, easy to compromise. And then, of course, in the army, to, to have this group bonding, there may be parting and eat and, and drinking and things like this. Uh, do you make a stand, take a stand? Easy to compromise. And sometimes when they compromise and then they indulge in all these things, then they begin to enjoy the fleshly uh, 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 things of the world. And then they, uh, it's not worth being a Christian. Now, let me just enjoy all these things, right? The carnal pleasures of life, so easy to, to fall away. So young people, I, we, we now right, pay attention to them, pray for them, we pray for them. The Lord may protect them. And now we take a special concern, right, in, in making sure our, our, our young people are taught properly, and I emphasize also that Christian education begins at home. Parents are responsible. You must teach them well. Yes, they come to church. Fellowship meetings, very important. Sunday school, very important. But then how about throughout the week? Our parents must pay careful spiritual attention to their children and pray for them. They go to school. They come back. I mean, what did they learn? How did they behave? And if you see anything wrong, wrong thinking, wrong behavior, you must be there to instruct them, educate them according to Scripture, spiritually, and correct them on the spot, and then pray for them. We must pay so much attention to our young people, and also our children. Not when they reach, te you know, uh, 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 reach their adolescence or teenage years. You know, they must be taught from day one, from the day they are born. Don't say, oh, they still cannot hear or cannot learn. They can hear. They are learning. And some young parents, so sad, after children are born, they don't come to church. And then they give excuses. Pastor, you don't know, my, my child is very noisy, you know. If I bring to church, it'll be, they'll be crying, making so much noise, disrupt. That's why we don't bring to, come to church or don't bring to church. I say, no, don't worry, bring them to church. The church has been trained right, uh, to, to hear the cry. <laughs> you want to hear your baby's cry. Of course, it can be disruptive. I say, if the baby is crying, maybe cold or hungry, you bring, out, bring the baby out for a while, uh, all right, uh, um, see what the baby needs, and then when the baby comes down, uh, bring the baby back. But don't stop. When you have babies, all the more important. All the more, it's so important for them to be found in the church from what? Day one. Even in the worship service, we don't have a cry room. Some, 
or baby's room, right? For them to cry. We don't have a cry room. And you as parents also can pray, Lord, please, during worship service, I pray my babies will be quiet. And then they also will be awake. And then they'll be listening. You can pray for that. And you, 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 you marvel how, yeah, the Lord will hear and answer prayers. So they participate in the worship from day one. They're hearing the, the, the hymns that are sung. Right? They're hearing the prayers. They're hearing the messages. Don't, don't say, oh, they don't understand. You see, sometimes we, we use our human reasoning. They don't know, they don't understand, but God's work is a spiritual work. And the Holy Spirit may be working, you don't know. And at that juncture, the, it, you know, you may have a baby, or your young child may be just one year old or two years old, and you're teaching about the deep things of, of Scripture, and you think they don't understand, they cannot fathom the depth and the truth of God's Word. But it's the Spirit that does the teaching, and the Spirit is working at that moment. Uh, the Holy Spirit can give a child a heightened understanding to appreciate right, the things that are being taught. Uh, you don't see it, but the Spirit is working. You pray for your children. And the Lord has blessed uh, True Life with uh, many babies. Last year, we have a record number of marriages. I never conducted so many marriages in my pastoral ministry. About a dozen marriages. Now babies are coming this year. Already half a dozen we have. All boys, interestingly. <laughs> no girls yet. All boys. Good. All qualified to be pastors and elders. We pray for them. And we pray for them consistently and constantly because they're so precious. And by praying for them as a pastor, I'm also reminding the parents, pay careful attention to their spiritual life. Bring them to church. So they come to church. We don't have a cry room, but I find that the babies, all right, the children are, are there and they are, and they are quiet. Right? They are peaceful. And I believe God is working also. Recently, we, at Easter, we had a we had a baptism, infant baptism. And it is possible that the Lord, of course, we pray. The, you know, in infant baptism, we are just claiming the promises of God. Lord, you have promised us salvation. You also say, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You are interested in our family, in our children that you have given to us. We also want them to to believe and love and serve, serve thee. We want them to be saved as soon and as early as possible. And when you offer your infants for baptism, uh, that, must, that is your sincere desire, your faith in the Lord and His promise. And of course, you, are, you make a promise that you will do your part to bring up your child in the, in the fear right, and the nurture of the Lord. And of course, the congregation participates in in helping you do that. And then the Spirit also, when we do our part, the Spirit also will do His part, right, to convict and convert. And it may be the case, at a very tender age, a few months old or a year old, a child may be born again already, you may not see it. But a child may be born again, right? It's possible. Salvation is of the Lord. And please don't think God can only save a, a, a person when, you know, he, he can understand or know the ABCs and are able to read and write. A human being is a human being. And due with what? Made in the image of God. And God in a most supernatural way can, can cause, as I've said earlier, a child to have a heightened understanding at, uh, at that moment when the gospel is preached and he's prayed for and then he believes right he believes and is born again of course we can't tell we can't see but of course as 
days go by, you'll see the marks of grace. As the child grows up, he, he or she will show right, uh, that uh, he has believed. He has become a child of God. You'll see it. But it can, this regeneration can occur very early. So, so our last baptism, I was quite amazed. And maybe even amused. When, you know, the... Uh, Yes. We have a number of babies, right, as I said, and then they came, the parents bring them for infant baptism. And then I baptized uh, one by one these babies and came to one, this little boy. His name is Ebenezer. Ah, this uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Khan, your nephew. few months old, right? not a year, not even a year, and then the parents, right, the father was holding, holding him, and then came to him, I, I called his name, and when I called his name, he suddenly looked up at me, big eyes, and then I took the water and was about to baptize him. When he saw that, he suddenly bowed his head and folded his hands. And then I baptized him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's taken. That's proof of it. Right? Photograph was taken. So is it possible that, you know, at that moment when the sacrament has been administered, the Lord did a wonderful work in the mind and the heart of this little boy can't speak yet, can't read, can't write, but he has ears, right? He has a mind, he has a heart, he is made in the image of God. Could God have done a supernatural work in his, in his life right there and then? And he believed? Possible. Of course, it's not the baptism that saves. But he has been brought to church. Parents have been praying for him. Right, singing gospel songs to him. Please don't think they don't understand. You see, it's a spiritual work. The Spirit may be working to give understanding. You just don't see it. As Jesus says, the Spirit is working and it is a powerful, invisible work. Right? And so it is for a person to be born again. So, so don't take this Likely, right? Your children, young people, we must pray for them and pray for their salvation, pray for their sanctification, and they will never, never depart from the Lord. Okay. And of course, we pray for the salvation of our loved ones. And thankfully, uh, we find, right, God working, parents who were very antagonistic against Christianity suddenly become all right very timid and very receptive i had one family parents were so against christianity you know but then the children have been praying for the parents the father especially and then finally one day father says i want to believe i thought i was going to have a hard time because I was called to the home uh, to, you know, to share the gospel with, with this man. And, 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 the, and, and the son already told me, my father is actually very against Christianity, but he, he now seems like he wants to believe. Can you please go to him? And then later on he shared, you know, before I came to the house, the father told the son, your pastor is coming. Please, uh, I hope he will not be so lossaw. You know, it's lossaw, no? Long-winded. Long yeah, when I went in, I didn't say, how are you? Talk about the weather. Immediately, I opened the scriptures and, <laughs> and read to him the scriptures. Explained to him, all right, his condition. How he must be born again. How to receive the Lord and preach to him the gospel. Do you want to believe? Immediately, yes. Oh, so easy, so quick. Uh, it's God's work. Someone so, again, so antagonistic, persecuting 
the faith of his children now himself believing baptized and so happy in the Lord and he was very sick at that time and says now I'm not afraid to die I know where I'm going uh, that is the sanctifying influence and grace of of uh, salvation and the sacrament right administered to strengthens the faith and the mother also got converted and now very happy so so God works right but he wants us to pray so that when he works uh, we know that he is the one doing it and he is uh, hearing us right and helping us and we experience his presence his power his working in our lives so prayer so important learn to pray So make sure in the church, I mean, here in the book of Acts, it gives us an infallible pattern to follow. How the church can survive and thrive. Of course, Acts 2.42 uh, is one verse we want to see as a pattern. The church should follow, continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Uh, the word of God is central, important. Make sure... All right, there is a strong pulpit ministry, Sunday school, Bible study. Thank God, FEBC can be of, of, of uh, assistance in this regard. Are you are uh, studying online. Uh, make God's Word very central. Study it right? very, very deeply and very well. Uh, don't neglect the Word. Uh, the Apostles' Doctrine. Of course, the Apostles' Doctrine now is what? The Holy Scriptures. The Apostles' Doctrine are now inscripturated. It's now the scriptures, so make sure you study the Bible. And fellowship also important, right? Again, the Christian faith is a one another faith and religion. Have fellowship with one another, provoke one another into love and good works. Communion, right? Communion is so important. Communion with God, communion with one another. It speaks of the worship service. We come together to have communion with God and communion with one another. Worship service is very important. Neglect not the assembling of yourselves together. And then, prayer. Right? Prayers. Uh, your own personal, private prayer. And then corporate or church prayer. Coming together to pray. All these so important activities in the church. Thus, BPC, WA have all these? Yes, good. Continue steadfastly in them. Understand how these, these means of grace will help you tremendously in your spiritual life and growth and how God can use you and glorify Himself through you. And then, and then you'll be a very, very happy, joyful, peaceful, truthful people indeed right manifesting the the wisdom of of these uh, creatures you have learned right preparedness precaution purposefulness patience perseverance right these things you'll find so i hope you will see and experience this in your life as the days go by and the lord is coming very soon so let us make sure we press on in all these things. Lord help us and bless us. Let us pray. Now someone asked what is the difference between psalms, hymns and spiritual songs? Someone also asked, can we just have instrumental music? Can, can we worship God with instrumental music?